and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you to the SFU Seniors Lifelong Learners Society uh, and the Society for the Study of Egyptian Antiquities Vancouver chapter for inviting me to talk to you on Egypt's momentous 2011 revolution. Simon Fraser University is special to me because it was the happy, lifelong academic home of the late Professor Bill Cleveland, a distinguished historian of the Middle East and my friend since graduate school days. Egypt at a turning point, the impact of the January 2011 revolution on culture, tourism, and preservation. I approach this topic today not as an archaeologist, Egyptologist or political scientist, but as a historian specializing in modern Egypt and the Middle East. This coming Monday it will be two years since the fall of Mubarak's 29-year dictatorship. Egypt is still in crisis. The shape of the new order is still undecided. Revolutions are often messy, confusing, and without clear endings. The coalition that made the revolution breaks apart. Deep-seated old regime structures and forces reemerge to challenge the revolutionaries, and hitherto little-noticed groups enter the political scene. In part one, I'll mention highlights of the 18 days starting January 25, 2011, which brought Mubarak down. Part two will treat selected groups and themes of the revolution. And part three will take up culture, tourism, and preservation and, in, and antiquities during these revolutionary times. Part one, 18 days of revolution. In the year before the revolution, Mubarak was presiding over a dictatorship ultimately kept in power by the military and a huge police and security force with the support of the United States. He ruled Egypt through perpetual martial law. Behind the sham of a republic and elections, he was grooming his son Gamal for succession, threatening to turn Egypt into that contradiction in terms, a hereditary republic. A handful of crony capitalists raked in fortunes while the poor and middle classes struggled. Prospects for Egypt's bulging contingent of educated young people were so bleak that many were doing their best to emigrate. When asked what future he saw for Egypt, one comedian joked, Egypt's future is in Canada. In the seven months running up to the revolution, three events were especially shocking. In June 2010, two plainclothes policemen dragged an unknown 28-year-old activist out of an internet cafe in Alexandria and beat him to death on the street. A Facebook page called We Are All Khalid Said quickly spread the news far and wide. That fall, parliamentary elections were so rigged that even token opposition parties were all but closed out. Finally, just after midnight on January 1, 2011, a Coptic church in Alexandria was bombed, killing 21 people. Egypt's plight was only a variation on authoritarian rule throughout the Arab world. The Arab Spring began in Tunisia on December 17, 2010. Vegetable cart vendor Mohamed Bouazizi, in despair after a confrontation with a policeman, woman, uh, set himself alight. In the ensuing three and a half weeks, the world watched amazed on Al Jazeera TV as Tunisian demonstrators brought down the 24-year-old dictatorship of Zain al Abidin Ben Ali on January 14th. Egyptians consider themselves leaders of the Arab world and said, if Tunisia can do it, why not Egypt? Day one, Tuesday, January 25th, 2011. 
Google executive, Wael Ghanim, the creator of the We Are All Khalid Saeed Facebook page, joined others in using the internet to call for a protest against Mubarak on January 25th. That was Police Day, a national holiday honoring policemen who had been killed by British troops in 1952 as part of the struggle for independence after 70 years of British colonial occupation. Now, the security police had become the oppressors. There had been street protests in recent years, but the police usually outnumbered and overwhelmed the demonstrators. This time, so many demonstrators poured out in Tahrir Square, Tahrir means liberation, and in Alexandria, Suez, and other cities that they could not be suppressed. Over the next several days of swelling protests, Nobel Prize winner Mohammed El Baradai uh, flew in to join the protests, and the government shut down Twitter, Facebook, the internet, and mobile phones. But it was too late. Three of the popular slogans of the revolution were bread, freedom, and social justice. The people demand the removal of the regime, shown here, and one word directed to Mubarak, go. On day four, the Friday of Rage, demonstrators followed the old tactic of mobilizing after the Friday noon prayer. Police attacks with batons, uh, tear gas, and water cannons challenged the attempts to keep the protests nonviolent. Here's the main bridge across the Nile to Tahrir Square. Demonstrators who died were mourned as martyrs with their pictures in the papers. This woman lost her son. Street art later showed martyrs with angel wings battling the police. After the overwhelmed police were suddenly withdrawn in the afternoon of January 28, police stations throughout Egypt were burned. So were the headquarters of Mubarak's National Democratic Party here. The army was sent in. It refused to fire on the crowds and was welcomed with the cheer, the army and the people are one hand. Day five, January 29th, Saturday, prison outbreaks created a wave of fear. Regime thugs beat up demonstrators. The police had gone missing, and neighbors banded together to protect their homes. Mubarak appointed a vice president who had been chief of intelligence and a new prime minister, an air force commander. Clearly, he was out of touch. The U.S. signaled that it would not back Mubarak to the bitter end. Day 8, uh, February 2nd, the Battle of the Camel. Uh, Pro-Mubarak plainclothesmen and hired thugs, some on horses and camels, attacked demonstrators in Tahrir Square. Muslim brothers and gangs of football fans known as ultras took the lead in fighting back. Strikes spread all over. Protesters camped out in Tahrir to stay for the duration. Fast forward to day 18, February 11th. Mubarak's refusal to step down was the last straw. SCAF, S-C-A-F, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, under Field Marshal Tantawi, uh, seized control, and Mubarak fled to a home he had in Sharm el-Sheikh, Sinai. The demonstrators were ecstatic. Part two, groups and themes of the revolution. First the euphoria, then the morning after. Mubarak was gone and the police and security forces badly shaken. But the tentacles of dicta dictatorship, sometimes called the deep state, remained intact with Mubarak appointees at the helm of the military, judiciary, universities, broadcasting services, newspapers, state-owned companies, and labor unions. These holdovers were denounced as falul remnants, uh, leftovers, 
uh, and the struggle over whether they would go or stay continues on to the present. The economy is a wreck. Misdeeds of the old regime remain unpunished. Islamists and secularists are at each other's throats, and there is a new wave of demonstrations and violence every few months. Let's take a closer look at SCAF, S-C-A-F, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. Mubarak had appointed all the top military officers, so why did they let him fall? One reason was their dislike of his son, Gamal, uh, who had a business degree from the American University in Cairo and his own circle of cronies. Uh, he was an outsider to the 60-year-old tradition of military rule. After Mubarak's fall, one of the questions is how SCAF went so quickly from being hailed as heroes to being targets of graffiti like this. SCAF's military rule was so unpopular that the new Islamist President Morsi was able to force uh, the military out of politics in August 2012. Four military men had ruled Egypt since 1952. Mohammed Naguib briefly as a front man in 52, Nasser until his death in 1970, Sadat until his assassination in 1981, and then Mubarak. In 1952, overthrowing the playboy King Farouk and a corrupt, corrupt parliamentary system dominated by big landowners, uh, Nasser came in with a populist commitment to the middle classes and the poor. He confiscated the landed estates of the Pashas, nationalized big business, and promoted Arab socialism. But his overreaching pan-Arabism ended in his disastrous defeat by Israel in 1967. He also left his successors a police state and an inefficient state-run economy. In the 1970s, Sadat switched from the Soviets to the U.S. as his Cold War superpower patron, made peace with Israel, uh, and moved toward free enterprise. Nasser had brutally suppressed the Muslim brothers, but Sadat in encouraged Islamists in order to balance off Nasserist and leftist op opposition. This backfired and he was assassinated by Islamist extremists. Husni Mubarak, an Air Force commander a generation younger than Nasser and Sadat, continued Sadat's policies but without his charismatic flair. Thirty years of the stolid Mubarak produced endless jokes. Shortly after taking over, Mubarak went to an agricultural fair and congratulated the owner of a prize sheep. Then he went on to admire a prize cow. At the third stall, he admired a donkey, only to be told, I'm sorry, sir, but there's no animal here. That's just a mirror. <laughs> Mubarak continued Sadat's U.S. alliance, uh, subservience to U.S. wishes on Israel, and the transition toward neoliberal capitalism. He pampered the military, which built up a whole separate economy uh, with factories which turned out consumer as well as military goods. President Morsi ousted Tantawi last August by cutting a deal with younger generals. Uh, they would withdraw from politics in return for the military's keeping its privileges and a defense budget immune from public scrutiny. SCAF had blundered badly in trying to rule after Mubarak and for now, the military is content to let civilian politicians take the blame in the face of intractable problems. Um, theme number two here uh, in part two. Uh, liberal or sec secular youth. Across the Arab world, the Arab Spring was a generational revolt of the young against dictatorships which had been around for their entire lives. Nasser had expanded education at all levels, but the decline in quality in the schools led those who could afford it to flee to private schools and hire private tutors in order to pass exams. 
Many university graduates cannot find jobs, have to live with their parents into their 30s, and cannot afford to get married. Many of these uh, young Egyptians are at home on the internet. The 1979 revolution in Iran, the Islamic revolution, was called the Cassette Revolution because tapes of Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, sermons helped set it off. The Arab Spring uprisings were in part Facebook and Twitter revolutions. Here the demonstrators uh, in Tahrir are recharging their uh, cell phones in a makeshift uh, arrangement. Here's a barcode showing that Mubarak is past his expiration date. In the two years since the uprising, however, liberal youth have been unable to match the Muslim brothers in grassroots political organization. The female half of the population, uh, number three here on, in part two, uh, are part of the youth groups, and the other groups we're discussing, but they also need separate mention. Suzanne Mubarak, the first lady, had promoted laws advancing women's rights and had set up children's libraries. But this was done in a top-down authoritarian fashion, and opponents derided the reforms as Suzanne's laws. Women were critical to the revolution. Asma Mahfouz's passionate appeal on a Facebook video helped inspire the massive turnout on January 25th. These different styles of dress suggest the range of ideologies among women demonstrators, uh, all of them revolutionaries. Unfortunately, the breakdown of law and order and continuing unrest have since led to increased harassment and public violence against women, especially female demonstrators. Number four of these uh, different groups, organized labor uh, played a critical role, little noted in the West, in the revolution. Government-controlled labor unions could not suppress the frustrations of industrial workers, and unauthorized strikes had been increasing in the years leading up to the revolution. A strike in 2008 at the textile fac factories in a Delta city led to the organization of an activist youth group known as April 6th, who were among the organizers of the revolution. What of the Islamists? The Muslim Brotherhood waited several days after January 25th before coming in on the side of the revolution. Even then, few of the slogans were specifically Islamic. Iran, which is not Arab, claimed that these were Islamic revolutions inspired by its own example. But neither this nor Al-Qaeda's claim to have inspired the uprisings caught on. Nevertheless, in Egypt, Tunisia, and elsewhere, Islamists would prove to be major beneficiaries of the Arab Spring. The Muslim Brotherhood was in Egypt, was founded in 1928 and has deep historical and social roots. Nasser persecuted the brothers after one of them tried to assassinate him in 1954. Sadat let them out of jail, as I uh, mentioned. Mubarak alternately jailed them and tolerated their running in parliamentary elections as independents. Extreme Islamists, such as the cell which assassinated Sadat, saw the brothers as sellouts uh, and split off to form more radical movements. The brothers have a two-fold appeal, a revivalist call to a return to early Islamic ideals and a social outreach program of services for the hard-pressed lower middle classes and lower classes. Their leaders include business millionaires, doctors, and engineers, President Morsi, uh, has an engineering doctorate from the University of Southern California. Uh, but their mass base is the lower middle class, especially in the provinces. Morsi has some democratic legitimacy, but has alienated many by his authoritarian decrees of the last six, seven months. 
in this uh, election poster for the Muslim Brothers, one candidate is clean shaven, uh, and another has the trimmed beard, which is popular with uh, Brotherhood members. Uh, the woman candidate illustrates brotherhood willingness to accept some participation of women in public life. Aside from uh, some ex-Muslim brothers who were expelled for having more liberal views, the other major group of Islamists are the Salafis or Salafists uh, who have flourished since the revolution. Some had earlier been apolitical, while others are survivors of extremist groups which had attacked the state under Sadat and Mubarak. Salafists are often more extreme than the brothers and are not a unified political force. Most would deny women any role in public uh, life. There's no uh, female candidate here as there was in the previous Muslim Brotherhood uh, poster. Um, Muslim Brothers and the second place Salafists won three quarters of the seats in the People's Assembly election last year, frightening non-Islamists. A court eventually de dissolved that People's Assembly, but not before it had appointed the Islamist-dominated commission which drafted the new constitution which Morsi rammed through last December. New parliamentary elections are planned for April, and that may they may indicate some erosion of support for brotherhood rule. The courts also barred the Muslim Brothers' most powerful politician, an old in intelligence chief of Mubarak's, uh, and, and an old intelligence chief of Mubarak's from running for president. So they knocked out uh, the leading bro Muslim Brotherhood candidate, said he couldn't run, uh, and the leading Mubarak candidate couldn't either. So the, uh, when the presidential elections were run in two stages, uh, you had many people running in the first stage and three secular candidates that were more or less centrist split 50% of the vote between them uh, knocking each other out, uh, and that enabled an alternate brotherhood candidate, Morsi, on the one hand, uh, to come in first, and just behind him, uh, an old uh, Mubarak uh, strongman. Uh, so these are the two who made it to the presidential runoff. Uh, and uh, this artist uh, is an artist's rendering of what he thought of the choices. Uh, what are you going to do if you were one of the uh, people who made the revolution in the name of uh, democracy, a, a, a retread of Mubarak or uh, a uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, candidate. Uh, and to him, they were both uh, fascists and uh, uh, there was nobody to vote for. Morsi uh, did uh, squeak through, uh, win the presidential election democratically, uh, but only by 51%. Uh, finally, the 8 to 10 percent of Egyptians who are Coptic Christians uh, follow their own uh, pope uh, who traces his uh, office uh, back to St. Mark in, in the first uh, cent Christian century. Uh, the bombing of the church on the eve of the revolution was one of a series of attacks on Cop Copts dating back to the 1970s. During the revolution, the aged and ailing Coptic pope Shenouda stood by Mubarak, but many young cops threw themselves into the demonstrations. Demonstrators emphasized Coptic Muslim unity, and cops stood guard against the police while Muslims prayed. These signs uh, showing crescent and cross together suggest that even some Islamists emphasize Muslim Christian unity. Despite such moving gestures, however, the underlying tensions remain, and attacks on Copts uh, have gotten worse since the revolution. Let's mention the phenomenon of security walls and street art uh, since the revolution. To keep Tahrir demonstrators from reaching the interior ministry, the parliament, and the presidential palace, the government builds up these block, cement blocks uh, across major streets, these massive walls. Uh, here's a, a map, no longer current, of these barriers right in the middle of downtown Cairo. 
Tahrir Square up in, in the corner there, uh, and uh, the, the black bars there indicating the, uh, uh, the, the walls. Uh, Cairo was already notorious for traffic congestion, and you can imagine what this did for traffic in downtown Cairo, uh, and it's still in that, uh, uh, it's really a breakdown of social uh, uh, and political normality, breakdown of normal life. Think of the Berlin Wall or the walls that seal off Israel from Gaza and the West Bank. Trying to tear down these barriers is one response from the uh, demonstrators. Uh, another response is to subvert them with graffiti and street art. This tank pointing at a defenseless bicyclist and a whimsical panda outraged military authorities who painted over it several times. Uh, here, uh, the street artists uh, painted a, a scene of demonstrators battling police uh, on, on this barrier wall. This is a close-up of part of the next slide. Look closely. The virtuosity here is amazing. Uh, half of what looks like a street scene turns out to be a, the painting on the uh, blocking wall. It's only the cracks there in the, in the blocks that give away what's the, the, the real part. Once Egypt joined the Arab Spring, no Arab country was immune. The Arab monarchies are still riding out the storm, but four presidents of dictatorial republics have fallen. Here's a scorecard of the bigger picture so far, but uh, today we're needing to keep our uh, focus on Egypt. Part three, uh, culture, tourism, and preservation. One of the la landmarks in many photos of the Tahrir demonstrations was the burning building in the background here, the headquarters of Mubarak's National Democratic Party, which I also showed earlier. It was perhaps the Bastille of the Egyptian Revolution. Although not a prison, prison like the French Bastille, it was sacked and burned on January 28th, 28th as a hated symbol of the old regime. This endangered another landmark right next door, the Museum of An Egyptian Antiquities, a treasure house of the national heritage. Fear spread that it might the museum might catch fire or be looted like the Baghdad Museum uh, in the wake of the US-led invasion of Iraq. A few antiquities were indeed looted from the Egyptian Museum but the shiny new museum book and souvenir store next door diverted most of the looters. The main story, uh, however, on the museum is one of the inspiring episodes of the revolution. At a time when demonstrators were being beaten up and even killed, the demonstrators threw a cordon around the museum to protect, protect this symbol of their national heritage. Away from the Tahrir spotlight, the collapse of, poli of the police all over the country led to scattered looting of archaeological sites. Gangs would arrive at archaeological sites, push aside the unarmed and poorly paid antiquities guards, uh, and loot warehouses of excavated finds or dig at random on the sites for treasure. With the police authority still weak, the problem is ongoing. Westerners are part of the problem, too, for the black market uh, for antiquities in rich countries fuels the demand that encourages the looting in Egypt. Some archaeological expeditions have managed to continue their work since the revolution, but uh, many others are uh, sort of waiting out for uh, things to settle down politically. As for tourism, it obviously doesn't mix well with revolution. Uh, in the year before the revolution, tourism brought in 12% of the national income and supported, in whole or in part, uh, one out of seven Egyptian families. Tourists fled when the revolution broke out, and hopes for recovery have been thwarted by political uncertainty and recurring bouts of violence. The words Egyptian tourism, of course, conjure up 
uh, for us images of the pyramids and the Valley of the Kings, but two other kinds of tourism are also vital for Egypt. Saudis and other oil-rich uh, Arabs uh, uh, emigrate to cosmopolitan Cairo in the summertime to escape restrictions on social life back home. Some bring their families, but a lot of Arab tourism is partying and nightclubbing and definitely not about antiquities. The second major uh, group of non-antiquities tourists are Europeans who flock to the Red Sea and Sinai to swim, lie on the beach, and party. Uh, the Red Sea is their Florida or Baja. You can fly direct without having to go through Cairo or see a single antiquity. If you are feeling dutiful, you can take a day trip from the Red Sea by bus to Luxor, but that's not what most beach tourism is about. Such sun worship on the beach is not exactly what the pharaonic worshipers of the sun god Ray uh, had in mind. <laughs> and uh, since, after all, our co-sponsor is the Society for the Study of Egyptian Antiquities, let's turn to antiquities tourism. Europeans have been touring Egypt since Herodotus, but the modern industry dates from Victorian times. It was the product of the Industrial Revolution, the steamship and the railroad. Its symbols included the Thomas Cook Travel Agency, a Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, uh, and the guidebooks of John Murray, Thomas Cook, and Carl Bedeker. This era of tourism climaxed in Egypt in the Edwardian Belle Epoque, which was Belle if you had the means to enjoy it, and was shattered by World War I. The discovery of the tomb of Tunugaman in 1922 encouraged a partial comeback of Belle Epoque uh, tourism, but the Great Depression, World War II, and their aftermath finished this off. Cook's Nile steamers were requisitioned for military use or sold for scrap, and rioters burned down Shepherd's Hotel in 1952. The rebuilt tourist industry under Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak was post-colonial, for the 1956 Suez War finally shattered British and French colonial interests in Egypt. The U.S. emerged after a struggle with the Soviets under Nasser, as the successor to the UK uh, as the predominant external power uh, on the Nile. The Nile Hilton replaced Shepherds as the iconic hotel, uh, but much of the new tourist infrastructure was Egyptian owned. Airplanes replaced railroads and steamships as the workhorses of the tourist industry. The Cairo airport beat out Alexandria and Port Said seaports as the main point of tourist entry. Instead of taking several months, a package tour could whisk you there and back in a week or 10 days. Edwardian tourists had amounted to a few thousand yearly. Uh, late Mubarak era figures were in the millions. This list of soundtracks for the sound and light show at Karnak provides a snapshot uh, of the widening range of Egypt's antiquities tourism. European languages still predominate, with Polish and Russian reflecting the expanding market in Eastern Europe. Japanese tourism is well established, and the Chinese are coming <laughs> soon. Uh, nostalgia for La Belle Epoque is part of a prominent theme of tourist marketing today. In recent years, I've accompanied University of Washington alumni group uh, tours to Egypt. Uh, our tour company's brochure ha hails General Gordon as, quote, the hero who helped tame the Sudan. Uh, and we've uh, <laughs> cruised on the Eugenie uh, named for Napoleon III's empress and fitted out in Second Empire decor. Of course, it's hard to feel very aristocratic with over 200 cruise ships crowding the Nile between Luxor and Aswan. Uh, up on deck, you can count three or four cruise ships ahead of you and as many uh, behind, 
and you tie up five or six thick at Luxor and have to walk through the other ships to get ashore. I happened to be there with a group in January 2011 when the revolution unexpectedly turned our trip into adventure tourism. (laughs) We got out with only minor inconvenience. Uh, There had been a few attacks on tourists in earlier years, but they were not targets in 2011. One perennial source of tension in Egyptian tourism is bound to continue. Most Western tourists consider themselves middle class, but are rich compared to most Egyptians. Uh, This five-star hotel where our group stayed is part of the glittering complex on the left, which has slums in the foreground. The uh, towers in the background there of the hotel block off the inhabitants of a poor district uh, behind it from easy access to the Nile. And uh, in the uh, picture of the hotel front there, uh, since the revolution, there have been protests uh, against the... uh, hotel uh, and what it's done to the neighborhood. Such contrasts of wealth and poverty are found in cities everywhere, but here the juxtaposition of wealthy foreigners and poor Egyptians uh, gives the tension a sharper edge. What difference might the enhanced influence of Islamists in the new order uh, make in tourism and attitudes toward antiquities? What would happen to beach tourism if conservative Islamic bans on alcohol, segregation of sexes, and appropriate dress for women were to be enforced? Can even enclave tourism manage the tensions between a society where a few women wear full face veils and the beach tourism where some European women at the Red Sea sunbathe topless? Egyptians dependent on tourists for livelihoods have a powerful argument of economic necessity on their side, but uh, sometimes they also try to answer the religious purists in kind. Uh, A recent minister of tourism declared, rejection of God's blessings, such as Egypt's unique location, a shining sun and warm seawater, is tantamount to atheism. Even Salafists can sometimes be pragmatic. A member of the Nur party, a Salafi party, uh, has suggested a one-year moratorium before reforming the tourist industry uh, in the hope that it might first recover from its slump. What of uh, Islamist attitudes toward pre-Islamic antiquities? People recall the nightmare scenarios of the Taliban dynamiting the giant Buddha statues in Afghanistan in 2001, or recent destruction of saints' tombs in Mali and um, manuscripts as well. These incidents, uh, I should emphasize, shocked most Muslims around the world. Last October, uh, an Islamist preacher in Egypt declared that destroying statues was a religious duty to prevent sedition and a return to idol worship. A religious sheikh in Bahrain reportedly urged President Morsi to destroy the pyramids as idolatrous. An Egyptian Salafist sheikh called for covering pharaonic statues with wax. Uh, He also made headlines by denouncing Nobel Prize winning Naguib Mahfouz's novels for promoting promiscuity, prostitution, and atheism. But Egyptians condemned this last sheikh's wild statements, and a Muslim brother defeated him in elections for parliament. This kind of extremism is rooted in attention going back to Quranic prohibitions of idolatry. The Prophet Muhammad destroyed pre Islamic idols in the Kaaba at Mecca, uh, and Muslim religious art. Uh, generally avoids depicting humans and animals. To keep things in perspective, however, remember that iconoclasm has also cropped up in Christian and Jewish uh, contexts. Uh, In the book of Exodus, uh, Moses destroyed a golden calf with which the children of Israel were worshiping. Uh, Think what a prize museum piece that would be today uh, if we had it. Uh, During the Reformation, Uh, Protestants attacked Catholic icons of Mary and Jesus as idol worship, 
destroying what would now be uh, priceless parts of the world heritage. Also note that in Egypt, it was early Christians, far more than Muslims who came several centuries later, who hacked out pharaonic images in the old temples. Um, in Arabic, the word pharaoh calls up the image of the idolatrous, oppressive pharaoh condemned in both the Quran and the Bible uh, in the Exodus story uh, for persecuting Moses and the Israelites. This book cover shows the repulsive pharaoh of the Exodus aghast at God's miracle of turning a staff into a serpent. Here, uh, an apocalyptic lightning flash associates the pyramids with the Quranic quotation, Lo, Pharaoh exalted himself on earth, which is the title of the book. Modern dictators are often denounced by pharaohs, uh, and that's not just the Islamist vocabulary, but secularists uh, do this too. Nasser is denounced as a pharaoh in these prison memoirs by a female activist of the Muslim Brothers. Uh, here is Sadat with a pharaonic staff uh, and an arrogant sneer as the ghost of his assassin looms over him. The book title is The Trial of Pharaoh. Uh, here Mubarak is condemned as an oppressive pharaoh. And I wish I had a picture of a protest sign I read about. Mubarak didn't seem to understand the plain Arabic word go. Uh, so they wrote it in hieroglyphs to be sure the pharaoh could read it. <laughs> Recently, President Morsi has been denounced as pharaoh. It cannot be emphasized too strongly, however, that Egyptians who would deface uh, pharaonic antiquities are a tiny fringe of extremists. Both medieval and modern Egyptian Muslim literature includes a strong tendency to stress the wisdom and wonders of the ancient Egyptians. That is the thesis of this uh, book uh, by an Egyptian uh, Egyptologist. Egyptology is usually seen as a discipline created by modern Europeans, but his uh, book title here is, is arguing that this slights a whole millennium of Islamic writers through the Middle Ages who voiced awe and respect and tried to learn about ancient Egypt and its antiquities. Modern Egyptians often argue that despite their outward appearance that the ancient Egyptians worshipped many gods and goddesses, they were really monotheists worshipping one underlying true god. The New Kingdom pharaoh Akhenaten is also popular. Uh, he attacked the old Egyptian gods in favor of one god represented by the sun disk and is often promoted as a forerunner of the monotheism of the Bible and the Koran. Uh, during the 1920s, when the discovery of Tunic Amun's tomb dazzled the world, Egyptian nationalists embraced their pharaonic heritage as an inspiration for modern revival. Egypt has produce, been producing its own professional Egyptologists at Cairo University, shown here, uh, ever since the opening of an archaeology department there in 1924. Pharaonic themes crop up frequently in modern Egyptian sculpture, literature, painting, music, and architecture. Here's the statue of the Awakening of Egypt. It's in front of Cairo University by Mahmoud Mukhtar, Egypt's most famous sculptor. Nobel Prize winning Naguib Mahfouz began his career with a trilogy of novels set in ancient Egypt. This extravaganza of neo pharaonic architecture is the Mubarak era supreme constitutional court. Uh, it's almost as though the architect here was trying to confirm that uh, Mubarak was acting like a pharaoh. Uh, after Nasser overthrew King Farouk in 1952, uh, they had to find a new national symbol to replace the king on the coins, and they chose the Sphinx. This pharaonic symbol eventually gave way to the eagle of Saladin when Nasser later turned to Pan-Arabism, but the paper money in Egypt still keeps a very careful balance. A pharaonic image on one side of the uh, banknote 
and an Islamic one on the other. I wonder about the recent one pound coin showing King Tut and the 50 piaster coin of Cleopatra. Uh, perhaps issued with Taurus in mind, do these images tip the balance in national symbols too far in the pharaonic direction? The uh, background images on these visa forms, which are a bit faint, but they're revealing. Arriving foreigners are asked to fill out the form with a pharaonic symbol, the bust of Nefertiti, while Egyptians uh, have to fill out one with an Islamic symbol, the mosque of Muhammad Ali. Uh, does this say the pharaonic antiquities are just for foreigners? Um, perhaps 80% of the usual uh, tour for foreigners emphasizes ancient Egypt, while Egypt's rich Islamic and Christian heritage gets only a glance. Could there perhaps be something after all in the Salafist suspicion that Western obsession with ancient Egypt approaches idolatry uh, and that Westerners are hostile or indifferent to Islam? By the eve of the 2011 revolution, a powerful trio of aging personalities exercised an outside influence outsized influence over cultural affairs. First Lady Suzanne Mubarak, perennial minister of culture Farouk Husni, and Zahi Hawass, the publicity-hungry head of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. All were able individuals who undertook some good initiatives, but they exercised power in the authoritarian manner of the old regime. In popular parlance, Zahi Hawass had become the pharaoh of antiquities, uh, part of Mubarak's entourage, and had to go. Secular Egyptians fear the rigid and narrow vision of Islam, which Muslim brothers and Salafists might impose. They noted that Morsi's platform in his presidential campaign made no mention of Egypt's rich cultural heritage. Not surprisingly, the separate syndicates or labor unions that represent tour guides, actors, musicians, painters, journalists, and writers all came out against Morsi in the clashes over the Constitution last September when he was pushing through an Islamist constitution. The current ministers of antiquity and culture are minding the store without much influence, while the heavyweights slug it out in the contest to shape Egypt's future. In closing, the struggle to complete the 2011 revolution by establishing a new political order which most Egyptians can support is far from over. Remember that it took the US eight years after the British surrender at Yorktown to, to agree on the federal constitution. It took the French almost a century after 1789 to establish a republic that most of its citizens could accept. The divisions in Egypt between authoritarian habits and democratic aspirations and between Islamists and non-Islamists is deep and serious but I'm optimistic that Egypt can avoid the breakdowns into civil war which have plagued Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and back in the 1990s, Algeria. Consider this inspiring photo of a woman uh, urging demonstrators forward to confront a wall of police during the revolution. For all of the struggles Egyptian women still face, they are not going to submit quietly to Salafist restrictions that would exclude them from public life. As for antiquities, uh, Coptic Christians identify with the pharaonic heritage more strongly than ever before. They've always been proud that Egypt gave Mary and Jesus and Joseph refuge when uh, they were fleeing King Herod's uh, persecution. 
Note that the medieval uh, painting of this event uh, on the left, uh, they're arriving in Egypt here, but it doesn't show any symbols that we would consider specifically pharaonic. Recent versions of the flight of the Holy Family, however, as on the right, often show the pyramids as essential symbols of Egypt. A wide range of Egyptians who consider themselves good Muslims, pious Muslims, but not Islamists, also embrace the pharaonic heritage as an essential part of their modern national identity. And even among Islamists, religious zeal does not necessarily rule out pride in the pre-Islamic heritage. The author of this book, Yusuf al-Qaradawi, is an influential Islamist exile who could not return to Egypt until after Mubarak fell. His book title is a strident Islamist call, the Sharia, the religious law of Islam, uh, valid for application in every time and place. But consider the signal sent by the pictorial symbolism on the cover of this book. On the global map, the black cube of the Kaaba stands for Mecca, uh, the Eiffel Tower for Paris, the uh, Tower of Pisa for Italy, Big Ben for London, and skyscrapers there for New York. Uh, what was chosen as the natural symbol to represent Egypt on this book by a de dedicated Islamist, uh, a deeply rooted pharaonic symbol, the pyramids? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.